So um, I go by Alex. You can call me Alex or Alejandro. Um, so I'm glad to be here. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Um, so the company is AI Cure. AI stands for artificial intelligence. And what we are doing is using artificial, artificial intelligence to revolutionize healthcare and have impact on everyone on the planet. That's, that's our mission. So I'll tell you what, what we do and, and, and uh, where AI is used. So if, the first question is to all of you, have you ever taken any medication? I, I suspect the answer is yes for everyone, right? Um, if you haven't, there's something strange. <laughs> the second one is a bit more sensitive and you don't have to raise your hand, but um, I think all of us know people that have passed away or have had serious illnesses, right? Um, so with this, with this, what I'm saying is that the technology that I'm going to describe will impact you and everyone on the planet because everyone takes medication at some point in their lives, whether it's prescription or it's off the shelf, it goes through a similar process, okay? So um, first a little bit about the company, AI Cure. Um, uh, we've been around for five years. During that time, the technology has been built mainly through grants from the NIH, um, about $7 million in funding through grants, um, plus some VC funding. Um, and strong patent portfolio. Um, it's been deployed in multiple areas, so the technology is actually used. We have actual clients, and we're at the point where we're scaling and, and uh, growing significantly. So um, I'll, I'll describe what it does, and uh, one of the awards that we got from the NIH, um, the Innovation Award, says that it has the potential in clinical trials and medication therapy. So medication therapy just means people taking medication for whatever condition they have. So you go to the doctor, the doctor tells you take these medications, that's medication therapy, okay? So two areas, one is clinical trials, the other one is population health. So it's, it's pretty big uh, scope. So what are the problems? Um, any medication before it goes on the market has to be approved. In the US, it's by the FDA, every country has its own equivalent. And before getting approved, it, it has to go through clinical testing with actual human beings, right? Um, but the intake during these tests is not accurately measured. So the way that it works is, you know, a pharmaceutical company will run a trial for a new drug and they'll recruit volunteers and then they'll pay them. And they'll say, well, you know, you take this medication once a week and we'll pay you this much money. And then we'll follow up and see what the side effects are. And um, so the traditional method is to do blood testing usually every two weeks. So between 5 and 10% of the, of the possible um, times in which a measurement can be taken is taken using the blood tests, right? So what happens is a lot of these volunteers um, don't actually take the medication because they don't care. They're getting paid. Uh, in many cases, they're low-income participants. We just need the money. So they'll sign up for the trial. They get paid. They don't take it. Um, and then, obviously, you know, when the trial is done, it's not clear who took it and who didn't take it, what the side effects were what they were not. So that's the clinical trials area. The second one is high, high risk, high cost, cost uh, patients. So HIV, cancer, where people just don't take the medication when they're supposed to, and so that's, that's a problem. And then the third one is, you know, probably we, we all fall into the same category. You know, I certainly do. I go to the doctor, I get a prescription, and I take half of it if I'm lucky, right? And then I have to go back to the doctor. So what are the problems with this, or the implications? And the first one, if the clinical trial is not done properly because people don't take the medication, um, obviously there are unexpected side effects that were not tested properly. Um, people die when the, when the medication goes out into the market because it wasn't tested properly. And then there are higher costs, right? Because often the, the trials fail. It's discovered too late that it wasn't done properly. They have to restart the trial or just completely, um, you know, get rid of the, that medication and, and, and try a different one. The second one, um, if you have a chronic illness where medication is really important and you don't take the medication, then you die faster or you get worse faster, you end up in the hospital, so again, higher costs. And the last one, again, you end up going to the doctor again and, and so on and so forth. So again, higher costs. So the adherence problem in medical clinical trials, the, estimate, you know, the estimates are around between 43 and 78 percent of the time. Um, Adherence actually happens. So that's the adherence definition. That means where you're, you're taking it when you're supposed to. So imagine you're doing a, an experiment with medication that you want to put out on the market, and it turns out that only 43% of the participants in the study actually took it, even though 100% of them said they took it. Right? That's kind of a typical scenario. Medication therapy, 
That's again, general population, about half of people don't take their medication. And this is not a, no, a new problem, right? This is a statement done, uh, made in 400 BC, right? So it's a behavioral issue, and that's really important, that we're focusing on behavior. So technology is secondary in that sense. It's really about behavior. Um, but yeah, a lot of medications are being wasted. You know, people open the bottles, they throw them out. Um, so a little bit of history on clinical trials, because I think this is kind of interesting. So the first one um, that we know about was done by King um, in biblical times, where he had an experiment. He, he thought people would be healthier if they had only, um, if they had uh, drink, wine, and, and, and meat. And so he did an experiment. Some people objected, and it turns out the vegetarians were healthier. So this was known a long time ago. Um, then in 1754, James Lind did another study uh, with patients who had um, scurvy, and he basically discovered th through this treatment that um, vitamin C, you know, helped um, with, with uh, that particular disease. And then in 1863, uh, the first planned clinical study was, was done with 13 patients. Now, if you look at the history, we're really at the beginning. You know, it's kind of amazing to me, you know, when I, when I found all of this, you know, the first double blind one was in 1943, then the first randomized was in 19, 1946. The largest one to date uh, was completed in 2007, and it took several years for the results to be published, and that included two million preschool children. So clinical trials today, and I'll focus mostly on clinical trials, but this applies to everything. Um, so there are currently thousands of trials being run concurrently all over the world, many countries, many uh, conditions. Um, one of the issues is when, when uh, drugs are patented, they have a lifespan. So every day that the medication is delayed in terms of being put in the market costs about $10 million. So that partly explains why the costs of medications are so high. So if we can shorten the, the length of the clinical trials, ideally the cost of medication will, will go down. Um, so the industry is huge, about $50 billion, and that's clinical trials only. I'm not speaking about general population health, which is way bigger than that. Um, there are many phases in clinical trials, and there's no need to go over the details, but essentially ev at every phase the, the drugs are filtered out, and so on only a small percentage of them make it all the way. That's one of the reasons there are so many trials being done constantly, and why it's so expensive to do them. Um, because it's a bit like a lottery. You know, they'll run the trial and, and only one in X will succeed. So what I'll do now is show you a video of what we've developed. And the important thing to keep in mind here is that it's not a video. In an ideal world, all it's it's process it in real time. That's why AI Cure is enabling the world's two billion smartphones with the intelligence to ensure they do. Our patented facial recognition and motion sensing technology automatically confirms medication ingestion. We make sure that the right patient is taking the right medication at the right time. Large biopharmaceutical clients are benefiting from higher adherence and more accurate data. Whether in clinical research or high-risk populations, new efficiencies and improved health outcomes are now possible. The interactive technology adapts to patient behavior and can be easily downloaded onto any mobile device. Improper use or suspicious activity triggers real-time intervention. There is no change to the manufacturing process. This means that the patient does not require any additional hardware and does not need to ingest anything other than the medication itself. With a portfolio of intellectual property and multiple innovation awards, AI Cure is transforming clinical research and the delivery of care with the potential to impact billions on a global scale. AI Cure, the definitive adherence solution. Okay, so um, I heard some laughter, and that's great, you know, positive reaction, but this is pretty serious stuff, right? Um, the reality is, you know, there's six, there will be six billion smartphones by 2020, and what you saw is the actual app running, uh, so it does it in real time. So it's, it's not recording a video and sending a video. It's actually recognizing the face in real time. It's recognizing the medication in real time, and it's uh, verifying that the medication is ingested, right? So again, the implications of this are huge, both in clinical trials and in general population. So I'll give a little bit more details. 
So the steps are face recognition, and, and one of the reasons for the face recognition is, again, with the clinical trials, um, what happens often is that people participate in more than one because they're getting paid. So it's like, wait, you know, I can have extra income. If I, you know, if I participate in 20 clinical trials, I'm not taking the actual medication, so I don't care. So I end up, you know, participating in many of them. So this is meant to prevent that. So you know it, that the person is the right one. Um, obviously, you want to recognize the pill and you want to uh, verify the ingestion. So the technology has a bunch of features that allow fraud detection because in some cases the patients will try to cheat. One example is drug abuse patients. They will, you know, they're given during their treatment, they're given um, sublingual medication which contains small amounts of opiates. So what these patients will often do is instead of taking the medication, they'll sell it on the street or exchange it for actual heroin or other drugs. So um, there, are, there are techniques within the technology and then we have a suite of solutions for different kinds of medications. So it's not just pills, inhalers, pens, all kinds of other things. And um, so part of their strategy includes having micro incentives, symptom tracking, um, feedback so that again, it's about changing behavior, right? And all of this data is reported in, in real time. So we have multiple dashboards that are used throughout the process so that the people administering the trial can see what's happening and they can react in time. The way that it's typically done, the standard way, is by blister packs, which basically they're packages that have, you know, 10 pills and they're numbered from 1 to 10. So what the patients or participants in the study will do is take one, you know, open it, and then they come back to the office and say, look, it's empty, I took all 10. Right? So obviously that doesn't, doesn't quite work. And then the blood, the blood tests. Um, there are other solutions out there. Um, so this is just a list of, of, of some of them that use technology. One that uses electronic pill bottles. So when you open the, the, the bottle, it detects that you opened it. The problem is, of course, people can open the bottle and throw away the medication anyway. Um, so that's not necessarily effective. There's another one where you have a chip in the actual pill. So you swallow it, and when you swallow it, it sends a Wi-Fi signal to a patch that you attach to your body. Um, that's very effective because once you swallow it, you know, it, it actually works. But it's super expensive. You have to change the manufacturing process. And the patch may cause irritation in, in, in some people. Um, and there's another one where you coat the medication with a substance. And then you have a device that you put in your mouth. And so you, when you blow into it, it'll detect that you actually took it. So this is the only solution uh, exists today that uses smartphones, that's scalable, that doesn't change the manufacturing process and, and so on and so forth. So the patient experience is basically depending on, on how we're doing, if, if it's a trial, we either give them the phones or they, they use their own phones and they, they download the app. So there's a little training video on the app itself that shows them how to do it. Um, and it's very, very easy to use. I mean, I have a demo. Anyone who's interested can, can try. I'm running out of time. Um, the basic idea is accountability, outreach, intervention. So if the patient is not taking the medication, the medical professional can call them and say, you know, he'll never call and say, you're cheating. But he might call and say, is everything okay? You know, we noticed that you didn't take it this morning. And one thing that's interesting to see is that the patterns in which people take their medication vary significantly. And so this is one example. Now, if you think about this at scale, you know, we have millions of people doing this and using this kind of technology we're going to be able to segment and be able to understand the side effects of, of different kinds of medication, prescribe the right amount, the right dosages, and so on and so forth. Um, one of the big impacts of the technology is that it allows the ones running the study, again in the clinical trials case, to determine when things are not going well, right? And you need a certain number of participants for the study to be valid. So if a number, if if a number of participants are not taking the medication and you discover that too late, the study is dead and that's the end of the trial and you wasted millions and millions of dollars because some of these trials cost $100 million or more. They're very, very expensive. So using the app in, in deployments that we've had, we found that even when comparing um, adherence, when people actually visit the, the center and they, they're observed by a human, um, adherence is stronger with the app. So people like the app. They like having this device that they interact with. Um, this is an example of the measurement points that we get with the AI Cure technology. So that's the, the pink line. And the lines are the measurements that you would get if you're doing only blood tests. So, um, um, so again, improvements um, when you use the, 
the app and the technology. And these are just graphs that show that if you detect early, so the, the one at the bottom, if you do early detection of, of um, participants that are not taking the medication, then you can intervene and, you, and the increase in number of, of, of uh, patients or participants is much lower. So I'll, I'll jump some of these. Um, financially, it makes a huge, huge difference in terms of the, the amount of money that's saved. And again, the hope is that these would be transferred to consumers. Um, we found that behavior patterns are consistent throughout the trial. So the, the way people um, act at the beginning is kind of consistent, right? So if they start using the app and they do well with it, they typically stick to it. Um, and then we have a bunch of dashboards. So let me jump a little bit. So again, when the patient is trying to cheat, we are able to see the images blurred because of uh, um, confidentiality issues. Um, and so the, the, the people administering the trial can see and then they can call the patient and they can understand what's happening. And again, if you look at the behavior, you know, somebody who's cheating is not going to do it once. You know, there's, there's, there's going to be a pattern over time. Um, so I won't go into these, but these are kind of the steps involved in the setting up of the trial. So there are a lot of complex issues that we work on and, and the different benefits. Some of the populations with whom we've done um, work already. So the app has been deployed in schizophrenia, um, opioid abuse, uh, stroke patients, HIV, um, and so on and so forth. So the machine learning part, I think it's pretty obvious um, if you look at it from a technical point of view, computer vision algorithms, behavior adaptation, interaction on the dashboards, predictive analytics, alerts, behavior analysis. Um, I should add that we're not only using computer vision, we're using the sensors on the phone, the motion sensor, the sound as well. Um, so a lot of challenge, technical challenges, both on the app and on the dashboard. And um, it's really, you know, it, it really encompasses human-centered computing, where we really need to consider user experience, data analysis, and all the human aspects, the psychology. With a schizophrenic patient, you cannot have the app say you're cheating, right? The app has to react in a very subtle way and in a very nice way so that the patient doesn't lose trust. So a lot of these things have to be taken into account. So our process is really user in the center, data, hypotheses, design. And I wanted to mention Maslow's pyramid because a lot of the work that I see in the technical world is really addressing the higher levels of the pyramid, you know. Um, and we're addressing the lower levels with this kind of thing. So I want to encourage everyone to join us. Um, and we are hiring, and that's the end of my talk. But it's a super exciting area, and I think we've seen a lot of talks on healthcare, and um, I just want to get people more, more into healthcare. Thank you. <laughs>